So dealing with divorce, difficult questions, biblical answers. This is lesson number eight, title of this lesson, Divorce and the Gospel of Grace. Well, uh, certainly we can all agree on the fact that divorce causes a lot of problems and a lot of burdens for individuals. Uh, physical burdens, people don't realize, you know, they just see the legal aspect of it, but I mean, when there's a divorce, you know, a lot of times you have to move. Just moving, moving your stuff, moving your furniture. Uh, money issues, how, you know, how are we going to split the, the salaries? Or if there's only one salary coming in, how is that going to be divided? And of course, the custody of the children. And so there are a lot of you know, physical issues, emotional issues, anger, resentment, the humiliation of it. People going through a divorce, you know, they haven't seen a friend in a long time. Hey, how's it going? Well, how's Joe? You know, yeah, we're not together anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, it's like, oh boy, you have to do that for a year. You know, that's kind of humiliating. People say, oh, and there's, I'm sorry for what? I'm sorry you failed. You know, I'm sorry you, you got into that situation. So you have to bear with that. And of course, uh, intimacy issues. You're married, you, you have your partner, you have intimate contact, and now you're alone. And so those things are gone uh, unsatisfied, um, but continue to be needs in, in, in your life. So there are a lot of ways to cope with these burdens. You, know, you find a new place to live, a new job, uh, maybe you work out some alimony issues, family and friends and counselors, uh, eventually they absorb the news and hopefully they're supportive. Uh, and then um, there's the issue of remarrying. That, that issue comes up later on down the line and uh, people remarry in order to find again ways to express not only their sexuality but uh, you know, efforts to, uh, to have companionship uh, um, in a married um, relationship. So those are some of the common things that uh, everyone who goes through a divorce uh, has to deal with. A lot of times, however, we continue to carry a burden even after we've landed on our feet. You know, two, three, four years you know, removed from the divorce, a person even is remarried and yet continues to carry this spiritual burden that can't be handled or corrected or taken by people because it's a spiritual burden. Uh, it's a heaviness of heart, it's a kind of malaise of the spirit that only God can deal with. You see, divorce and whatever comes before or after it causes guilt. I mean, <laughs> universally, it causes guilt, uh, shame, sometimes fear because we know deep down inside we have in many ways uh, failed, uh, even offended God in some way. You know, <laughs> I've always said even the quote, innocent individual, even the innocent individual, the one who's been abandoned, let's say, by one of the spouses, even that person feels guilt. They may have not done anything terribly wrong, but they feel guilty because, well, they're thinking, I should have tried harder, maybe I should have hung on longer, you know, whatever. They feel guilt. And the guilty party, you know, we're always ready to say, well, that terrible person, they left and so on. But that person also feels guilt. They may realize, you know, I, come to think of it, I could have done better, or come to think of it, that was a stupid thing I did, or whatever. There's always this guilt and this burden uh, that people carry after a divorce for a long time. I, I said three or four years, I, 20 years, 25 years. So for the person that's struggling with these burdens, God brings the good news. The gospel. You know, people try to, uh, they go see a counselor to deal with their guilt and I say to them, the counselor is the wrong person to deal with your guilt. The counselor will help you deal with your depression and your feelings of you know, self-worth, okay. But only God can help you with the guilt part. And what He offers the, the, the person to deal with their guilt um, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So for those who are worn out by the guilt and the fear and the discouragement, the spiritual discouragement caused by divorce in their lives, the gospel is really good news for you. So in order to explain how this is so, in other words, how the gospel affects the individual who has failed in marriage, we need to talk about the idea of perfection because this is what's at the root of this feeling of, um, of guilt. Now, the Bible is important for many reasons, 
but especially because it is the method by which God reveals to us what He is like and what we are like and what is necessary for there to be peace between Himself and ourself. In order to have peace with ourself and God, you know what we need? We need perfection. We need to be perfect. That's the only way that we can have peace with God. Otherwise, we see our imperfection and realize we can't have a relationship with Him if we are imperfect. And because of that thought, people feel guilty. Now, note how the Bible explains various states of perfection. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when God created the universe, God and the universe, these two things, they were perfect. He didn't make a mistake is what I'm saying. There was nothing in the universe, nothing in His creation that was wrong or, or not perfect or not complete. So that's you know, in Genesis, talk about God and creation, there's an idea of perfection. In Exodus 20, you know, uh, Moses receives the law of God and so uh, 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 mankind obeying God's law, that's perfection. God and man are you know, in a perfect relationship if man uh, obeys all the commandments of God. There's another example of perfection. Uh, Matthew 5 to 7, you know, the beatitude, blessed is the man who do this. But, well, that's an example of how men, mankind, lives together in perfection, turning the other cheek going the second mile. There, there, there is the spiritual walk that an individual has to uh, make or has to complete in order, to be, uh, in order for there to be a perfect relationship with, uh, with uh, human beings one uh, to another. And then of course in Genesis 2, God gives the perfect situation for um, uh, marriage. One man, one woman, for life. There's, there's perfection. So you see what I'm trying to get at? You know, God in His universe, before anything happened, that was perfection. Uh, man and God, man obeying all the commandments, that's perfection. Well, as far as marriage is concerned, one man, one woman, married for life, that's perfection. Okay? That's the ideal. All right. So the Bible also reveals our true state or condition not as being perfect, but rather being imperfect. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 32, in Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, in various places, uh, Paul explains our true condition. Our true condition is not that we are perfect, it's quite the opposite. Our true condition is that we're imperfect. We're sinners, right? All have sinned and share, uh, fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so in Romans, he reveals that all have sinned and ultimately all are condemned to death or condemned by God because of their sin. Now, there's nothing an individual can do to change or fix this imperfection. I mean, once you realize you're imperfect, you're already imperfect. There's nothing you can do to, to change that as an individual. All right, so let's add this, let's, let's apply this thinking now to marriage, shall we? So this imperfection sometimes happens in marriage. Remember the ideal? The ideal is over here. One man, one woman for life. But sometimes that perfect ideal <laughs> is not realized. So you have a man, for example, who commits either fornication or hatred or uh, other, types of, um, other types of sin, adultery, abandonment married to a woman who herself may commit fornication or hatred or adultery or abandonment. You know, it works both ways. You have, so, and what happens? A divorce happens because of any one of those reasons or several of those reasons. So you have the perfect ideal over here, one man, one woman for life. That's the perfect ideal established by God. Then you have reality. <laughs> reality is many times you have a man and a woman, but because of all these other things, they destroy that ideal, they get, they, they have a divorce. So once the marriage is destroyed or quote made imperfect, we can improve it maybe, you know, we go to counseling and maybe we stay together you know, and bump along for a while, or we dissolve it through divorce, but we cannot through our efforts make it perfect again. That's gone, okay? 
So I, these are all, this is all the preamble. You have to keep all these pieces together here to help, uh, to help me get to my, to my point. God deals with imperfection, right? He also deals with imperfection in marriage. The burden we feel is the weight on our conscience produced by imperfection. Because deep down, as children of God, we want to be perfect. You know, I tell people, I know I'm not perfect. Boy, do I ever know I'm not perfect, but I want to be. That's the problem with the Christian. I know I'm not perfect, but boy, I want to be, and I'm trying to be. Well, in the same way, a marriage is, that's imperfect, you know, uh, even if the marriage has been destroyed, doesn't mean that people wanted it to be destroyed. They wanted it to work, and it didn't. So how does God do this? Well, He restores perfection in the marriage by putting a perfect life, Jesus Christ, over our life to make it perfect in every area. That includes our imperfect marriages. So I'm a sinner and I stole and I've killed and I've done all kinds of things and my life is totally imperfect, absolutely. But when I come to Christ, I repent and I'm baptized, what happens? Christ superimposes His perfect life over my imperfect life and thus my life is made perfect in the eyes of God. We get that, that's the good news of the gospel. Well in the same way, when we have broken a marriage, when that marriage is imperfect, so on and so forth, how do we make it perfect again? Not through counseling, not, no, 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 no. It becomes perfect again in God's eyes, why? Because as a Christian, Jesus Christ is superimposed over our imperfect marriage, and in God's eyes, that marriage becomes perfect. That's how you apply the gospel to every area of life. So once the marriage is destroyed, made imperfect, as I say, we can't improve it, you know, we, we, we can dissolve it, but the only way to make it perfect is to put the cross of Christ. That's why we say the cross of Christ is the symbol of perfection. It's the symbol of grace. So when the devil accuses me, you're no good, you're never going to get to heaven, How, what do you think? You know, I, I point to the cross and I say, yeah, I know I'm not, but because of the cross, I'm acceptable to God. I'm perfect in His eyes. The devil said to me, well, what kind of guy? You, you've been married twice and you know, boy, you're never going to make it. You know, don't you know adulterers are going to hell and blah, blah, blah. And I say, yes, what you say is true about me. That's true. But because of Christ, <laughs> He has superimposed himself over my situation and made it perfect in God's eyes. That's why we walk by faith. You know, we walk by faith even though we realize we're not perfect. In the same way, someone who has failed at marriage still walks by faith in order for his situation or her situation to become acceptable before God. So the good news of the gospel the good news of the gospel is that whatever your situation, whatever your imperfection, when you add the grace of God to it, symbolized and made possible by the cross of Christ, you make it perfect in God's eyes. Not in man's eyes, in God's eyes. This includes imperfection that is caused by divorce. You can work at improving your life improving your situation, improving your weakness, but the only way to be perfect is to accept the grace of God offered to you by God in Christ. And of course, we know how to do that. We believe, we repent of our sins, confess Christ, we're baptized, we live a, a fruitful life. This is the way to grace, which is the way to perfection. There is no other way to be perfect. No other way to be perfect. No other way for the individual to be perfect in God's eyes other than accepting the grace of God. No other way for a marriage that has been destroyed and another marriage taking place, whatever, no other way for that situation to be made right in God's eyes other than through the grace of God. Okay. Now, when we are perfect, we are released from guilt and shame and fear. So there are issues regarding the gospel and the sins of divorce and adultery. You see, if you're a thief and you've stolen half your life you know, uh, as a way of uh, earning a living 
and you've gone to jail and everybody knows you're a thief and then finally you come face to face with the gospel and you, 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 know, you repent and then you're baptized and you start you know, living a better life and so on and so forth. People still know, you're, oh that guy, he's a thief, he's an ex-con, this guy, you know, I wouldn't trust him, no way. You're a thief in everybody's eyes, maybe a reformed thief, but still a thief, right? But because of the grace of God, in God's eyes, you're not a thief anymore, you're perfect. Well, in the same way, if you're a divorced person, People look at you, oh, you're, you're divorced, but you've been married three times, you're a divorced person, huh? this is your third marriage, you know? fourth, whatever it is. You know? But if you're a Christian, you're able to say, yeah, that's the way you see me, and that's the truth. That's the truth of the matter, that's the way you see me. But when God looks at me, He sees me through the lens of Christ, superimposing Himself upon me and my situation. So in His eyes, I'm acceptable, even if I'm not acceptable, in your eyes, all right? So there are questions around this idea. One of the first questions that people will ask is, well, what about repentance? You know, before, a Christian, before becoming a Christian or afterwards, how about, you know, what's your repentance supposed to be concerning your adultery or your divorce? So the person in the middle of a divorce or on the other side of divorce needs to be asked the question, have you sinned? Now the Bible describes what is sinful conduct clearly. Any violation of the perfect model. One, if you're talking about marriage. One man, one woman for life. The question is, have you sinned? In other words, have you lived up to that model? And if the answer is yes, then that person needs to answer the question, are you then willing to repent? And then repentance needs to be done. Now, here's where the problem comes in. Everyone has an opinion as to what should be done in order to accomplish repentance for the person who has been through a divorce. Some say, and I've heard them, some say, well, that person needs to dissolve their existing marriage if they really want to repent and go back to their original spouse or remain celibate for the rest of their life. That's the repentance. Others say, no changes whatsoever, we're under, you know, we're under the grace of God. The problem arises because we demand repentance based on law instead of repentance based on grace. There's the problem. For example, there's legal repentance that I call. Legal repentance stresses restitution and punishment. So what is the restitution or punishment for divorce? The answer, well, you, know, you failed at this. So the repentance, the law repentance is celibacy. You, you're not allowed to have sex the rest of your life. Or if you want to be married, you got to go back to the first person you were ever married to and go back to that person and you know, get remarried with that person or you have a reduced role of fellowship. You are actually a second class citizen in the church. If you're a man, well then you cannot teach, you cannot hand the plates out of communion, you certainly can't lead a prayer. You know, we'll tolerate you in the building, you can sit and listen and you can give, uh, you can give all right, but you can't go for, if you're a woman, well you know, at the ladies things, you can't speak, you can't take a leadership role, you know, that's okay. So the thinking behind this is a person destroys a perfect situation and if that person cannot restore it, we impose some form of punishment or work or restraint. Legal repentance is external. Something is done to you because of what you have done. Then there is repentance based on grace. Repentance based on grace requires a change of heart, not a change of status and not punishment. The best example in the Bible, David and Bathsheba. We all know the story, I'm not going to take up time reading it. David and Bathsheba. So what was David and Bathsheba as well, but what was David guilty of? Well, adultery for sure. He knew she was you know, Uriah's wife. Deceit. He lied about it to everybody. 
murder. I mean, premeditated murder. He had her husband killed in battle on purpose so he could kind of take her as his wife and cover, thing, you know, cover everything over. So if the repentance required of him was based on law, right, legal repentance, then he had to be executed. That was the punishment for adultery and murder. He had to be executed and his entire line would have to forfeit the throne. Repentance on grace, however, required a new heart. Grace repentance is internal, not external. It's internal, the repentance, and something is not done to you, something comes out of you. Big difference, big difference. In Psalm 32, listen to the Listen to the voice of David after you know, he had been forgiven and after all of this has happened. He wrote this psalm you know, after this episode. He said, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. <laughs> okay. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, what do you think he's talking about? What sin he's talking about? Well, the adultery, the, the, all of that stuff. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I felt guilty, right? My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah there is simply an instruction to the reader to pause and consider what has just been said. He goes on, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord Loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. So repentance based on grace for David meant he had a changed heart. He wrote this after, after he had done what he had done and after he learned that God for, he confessed his sins to God and God forgave him, he wrote this. Now we know historically he remained king and he married the woman that he had an affair with and then had later on had a son with her uh, called Solomon. That's repentance based on grace. Another example again familiar you know the unmerciful servant a parable you know, he couldn't pay the debt. He had a huge debt to his master, you know, millions of dollars, and the debt was forgiven because his master you know, felt sorry for him. He wasn't put on the installment plan. The master just forgave him the debt. And then we read that someone else who owed the servant money, uh, that servant uh, was not as kind, you know, and he demanded his money, right? And then ultimately he was, he was uh, punished. Let's just read the end of that. It says, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? No change. You see, my point is no change here. He was forgiven for a great debt he couldn't pay. Somebody else now owed him. What did he do? Did he, did he, did he mirror the forgiveness he received? No, he, he did, his heart didn't change. He demanded payment. And of course, at the end of the parable, he himself, again, was, was punished. 
because of an unchanged heart. It wasn't about the money, it was the unchanged heart. So with the sin of adultery and divorce, the repentance requires an examination of the heart to find out what is the root of the problem in the first place and then change in that thing. That's what's required. Celibacy, dissolving existing marriages, reuniting divorced couples by force, disfellowshipping people, all of this does not accomplish what God requires in repentance. God requires a changed heart, not a changed status. However, however, this desire to change, whatever it can be, a, a lustful heart or pride or lack of self-control, perhaps arrogance or laziness or inflexibility or selfishness or unfaithfulness or ignorance, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be changed. A desire to change those things, that's what God wants. And this will change the heart and permit a new person to emerge, ready to succeed at what they once failed. As I say, God is more interested in a changed heart than in punishment. He's not interested in punishing you. He wants to change you. And Christ died to set us free from law and to give us a new life, not punish us. <laughs> That's us, that's our thinking. The people that propose those ideas there, and I'll go on further in, in lessons to come, I'll explain the Greek and the context, and I'll, I'll do the, the due diligence as far as the Bible is concerned, but I just wanted to give you the summary up front here. Now some people will say, well, if we're under grace, why even bother to repent? You know, Romans 6, 15. Well, we must repent, we must change. For all, you know, for all situations, but even for marriage, because of three reasons. Number one, God will punish the unrepentance, uh, the unrepentant. You know, God will punish those who don't repent, like the unmerciful steward. He didn't change. He doesn't require restitution. Here's the point. People who promote this idea, you know, go back to the first one, dissolve the marriage, live in those people, what they're trying to do is make the guilty person pay restitution for their failure at marriage. What they don't understand is that the restitution for all of our sins, including our sin of divorce, has been paid for by Jesus on the cross. That's the whole idea of the gospel. It's like taking the gospel and throwing it out the window when it comes to the sin of divorce. Like a guy who murdered 10 people, even though he's in jail and maybe you know, in jail for life, calls out to God and you know, somebody preaches the gospel to that person and that person is baptized and that person is forgiven for his 10 murders. <laughs> but the little girl in, 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 uh, in uh, Kansas who got married when she was 17 you know, and divorced when she was 21, oh that girl, she's going to hell. <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. When you, when you just think about it for a moment, what kind of God do we have? <laughs> so it's not a God that is exempt from punishing people. Yeah, you do have to change. You do have to repent. You will be you know, condemned if you don't repent, absolutely. And we try to avoid sin because we don't want to become slaves of sin again and die, right? I mean, even if a person becomes celibate, but doesn't change his selfishness, which caused the problems in the marriage in the first place, will he no less be condemned? <laughs> Think about that. You're selfish, self-centered, you know, cruel, violent, and those things are what led to your divorce. Do you think that if you don't change the cruelty, the selfish, you know, if you don't repent of those things, do you think that you'll go to heaven just because you never married again? Because the fact that you got a divorce, that's just the outcome of the things that caused the divorce. God is interested in you changing the things that caused the divorce. There's where your repentance needs to be. So you know, condemning someone to a life of celibacy, you know, they can't marry again, doesn't change the, you know, the essential character that that person has. 
And that's what God is trying to get at. And then of course, avoiding sin glorifies God and demonstrates His power working in your life. Some people see grace as an excuse for sin, you know, a reason for mediocrity in their spiritual lives. I don't have to try too hard because yeah, I'm under grace, you know, that attitude. Or they see, they see grace as a defense for lack of deep commitment to Jesus Christ. However, grace is the reason for our confidence. It's the power of God to overcome sin in our lives. It's the comfort that God gives us when we yearn to be free from the body of sin joined to Christ. Brothers and sisters, I never met anybody who got married with the goal of eventually failing at marriage. Nobody. Everybody gets married because they love and they want to be together and they want, to, you know, they want the good things. They pray, God, please help me. And 15 years down the road, the thing you know, blows up. And then the, those two people, you know, after they go through all of that, let's say they, they, you know, they want to remarry. And why, what is the desire? Why do people want to be, re, be remarried? Because God made us that way. We're hardwired to be with someone else. It's not good for man to be alone. It's one of the first things that, that is said. So of course people want to remarry. That's not an aberration. They just want, and then my point is, so they remarry, okay? Well, do you think in their minds they're saying, well, I'm going to remarry, and this time probably I'll get a divorce even faster than last time. No, <laughs> they're getting remarried because, well, they, they want the things that they didn't get in that first marriage. They want to succeed. I mean, I've met people who've been married like five times. I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying I've met people who've been married five times and they're going on number six. They weren't Christians. They're going on number six, but it, number six wedding, oh, this is the one. <laughs> this time I'm going to get it right. You know, I hope, always hoping you know, to, to succeed. My, my preaching and my point is always, and God wants you to succeed too. He doesn't want you to fail. So there are those who say that this idea concerning the true meaning of the gospel, and more specifically in the area of divorce and remarriage, is simply the preaching of cheap grace. Oh, that's cheap grace. Well, I have news for you. Grace is better than cheap. It's free. It's free. What does Paul say? For the wage of sin is death, we know that. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That covering over your situation, your life, your imperfection, your imperfect marriage history, that's the grace of God allowing you to be perfect in His eyes and knowing that by faith allows you to live in joy and peace and expectation and hope, not in fear or guilt. The only one who wants you to feel guilty for no reason is the devil, not God. He wants you to feel free. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to feel strong and powerful and ready to serve and be full of faith and good works and good deeds. That's what he wants from you. And if that's what you're feeling and if that's what you're doing, great. Only the devil is there to make you feel guilty for past sins that you've been forgiven for. As I said before, that's his only game. It's just a game of attrition. He's always there to just beat on you as much as he can. Take away any joy that you might have that God has legitimately given to you and if he can water that down, if he can just spoil it for you, even if he doesn't draw you into sin, if he can just spoil what God has given to you, that's a victory for, that's a victory for him. So maybe that's the problem. You know, we still want to pay for our salvation somehow. You know, the bigger the payment, the greater our pride is fed. Now grace is free for us, but let's never forget that it was not free for God. It cost Him the suffering and death of His beloved Son. For this grace, I myself am personally grateful, and I hope never to violate it. And I also hope that you'll receive it for your lives as well. So let's kind of summarize what we've said about God's grace and how it applies 
to this particular situation that we're talking about. Number one, whatever your situation, if you add grace to it, it becomes perfect. Now the condition to this rule is that you cannot continue in that sin and be made perfect through grace. In other words, you can't continue to steal and be made perfect through the grace of God. You can't continue to, to be an active homosexual. Let's say you have same-sex feelings, right? And, and, and you call out to God for help and you become a Christian. You, you, can't, you can't remain perfect in His sight if you continue to act out on those same-sex feelings. You can still have those feelings, that's not a sin, but you can't act out on those feelings and not sin before God. If you're a liar and you, you know, God makes you perfect and forgives you, you can't continue lying as a way of life. So grace presupposes that you will abandon what is truly sinful. You know, grace demands a true repentance of a changed heart. Repentance can't always fix all the damage in the past, you know, what you stole, or past sexual sins, or the damage from your lies, or a broken marriage. But a changed heart will avoid these things in the future, and grace will cover your mistakes and ongoing struggle with these things. So let's remember that. Number two, if you're not a Christian, you enter this perfection through grace by faith, and that faith is expressed biblically by confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of sins, being baptized, of course, living faithful. I think we know that. And then number three, if you are a Christian but have fallen, confessing sin, abandoning sin, and accepting God's forgiveness through prayer, this is the way to restore your perfection. Okay? So the mark of true Christian maturity is when we have a strong enough faith in Jesus Christ to accept His grace to make us perfect without, without efforts to perfect yourself through legalistic rule keeping. In other words, the mature Christians simply accept I am perfect in God's eyes because of God's grace, not because of what I do, not because of what I try, not because of what I perform. Everything I do as a Christian, I do it in order to glorify God. I do it to say thank you to God, but I don't do it in order to save myself or to make restitution for all the dumb things I've done in my life and continue to do in my life. Restitution for that has been made on the cross. I simply accept it. And that's hard to swallow sometimes. We'd like to do something. No. You want to do something? Then do something that honors God. That's what we do. Okay, uh, you, know, you can't cover all the issues in this kind of tricky topic in just one half hour lesson, so we'll continue. Next time we're going to do the most asked questions about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So I'll tackle some of those tricky questions next time. All right, thank you for your attention.